again. You could say, in a sense, that the church of Corinth had a lot of carnality in it. And there's no doubt in my mind, I was thinking even this week, that there's a lot of carnality in a lot of churches all across this country and really in this world. There's a lot of carnality in it. And every church is responsible to answer to God. A pastor and I aren't responsible for any, anybody else other than this church, our church, and the, the people that God has entrusted with us. And uh, the other pastor down the road is in charge and responsible for his church. And so we all give an account to God, just as Paul gave an account to God for the church he ministered at at Corinth. And so he was constantly trying to teach them things, try, trying to teach them doctrine and biblical truths. And he couldn't do much more than the basic, simple things because of their immaturity and spiritual, uh, spiritual things. And so uh, we went through down to verse number uh, 8, and we looked at... Uh, there in verse number three, how he speaks of carnal and refers to about envying and strife and division. Shouldn't it be anything in the Christian's life uh, that, that really breaks that fellowship with one another in the Lord? And then uh, Paul basically gives in verse six, he gives an appeal and then an application in verse number seven. Uh, the idea of watering and planting, what our responsibility is. And then in verse eight, uh, we talked about the Holy Spirit is the Lord of the harvest. And uh, the, we finished with this last week of six ways a church grows together, and uh, how how does a church move forward together? No doubt in days past we've gone forward together. This week especially we've moved forward in a big way, a big step of faith to take on this uh, getting of a van, a new van, and having a payment on that each month, and that's a big step of faith. But we believe God will help us move forward together. But we know through the Word of God, through prayer, through trials, through God examples, through fellowship, and through serving, we find that churches grow together. And so we come tonight to verse number 9, and uh, really we're continuing through that same over, over uh, all heading of these verses 1 through 17 of the carnal spirit, uh, but tonight really is labeled as this, verses 9 through 17, we find the fruits of carnality, uh, the fruits of carnality. And we're going to begin in verse number 9 tonight. Let's pray tonight together and ask the Lord to help us, and just want to get you caught up where we are, and we're going to get down to verse number 15 tonight. Lord willing, and give you a couple of truths here, and not be very long this evening, and it was to move along, and, and Lord, ask, ask the Lord to give us something we need this evening. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word tonight, the opportunity to open the word of God, to hear from you tonight. We pray that the Holy Spirit of God would just speak to every heart in this room, including mine tonight. Lord, we pray you just meet with us in a special way. Lord, we need you tonight. We need something from you to help us and encourage us, and Lord, help us to be just encouraged to uh, be or better servants for you, Lord, to be <clears throat> better witnesses for you, and uh, Lord, just to move forward as a church, to grow together, and uh, we thank you again for the time tonight, the singing and the, uh, just the praising of your name, Lord, may everything else tonight be honor and glorifying to you, and we ask all these things in your name we pray, amen. So in verse number nine, Paul gives us really two pictures here in verse number nine. Look at verse number nine in chapter three. It says, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. So Paul gives us two pictures here. The first picture is a man working in the harvest or a man working in the field. What a privilege to think about tonight just for a few moments that, that our privilege and opportunity we have to be God's fellow workers. We're to be co-laborers with him. In other words, the Holy Spirit indwells in us and that he works through us to accomplish the things that he would have us to do and the things as he pleases. He oversees uh, the, the, the word and directs us where he will with the mission field. In other words, that the word of God is it works through us and we understand what the scripture says and to go and to preach and teach all nations. And that's the word of God, the great commission for us. And God works through us to see more people come to Christ and to see more done for the cause of Christ. Why do we buy a church van? Because we want to see more kids come to Christ. Not because, hey, look at our new van and look at the things that God, look at how we're doing. No, we want God to be glorified. And Dad already made mention of that earlier, and it's about the Lord. Christ can use you and I to reach a lost world right here in our own city. We have fellowship with the Lord to be used right here in our own city, our own area. And we can look around us and see opportunities. When Paul refers here in verse number 9 to that husbandry, uh, you know, oftentimes we think of a wife and a husband, and but this is not what that is referring to. It's referring to a, a farmer or a farm work. I, I was thinking this afternoon, I had the opportunity, we had a man in my dad's church, Virginia, that had a, had a dairy farm, and um, dairy farm is hard work. I don't know if anybody here has worked on a farm. I don't think Brother Charles had family, had farm, and 
And uh, if you worked on a farm in any period of time, it is hard work. Uh, I remember getting up early in the morning and, and going in to milk the cows. You had to milk them early in the morning and, and sometimes two or three times a day. And it was tough work. It was hard work. I remember there was uh, times where I just felt like it, it, I, I would never get through the day. Things would not always go as planned. But it was hard work, hard labor. And, and Paul uses this analogy or this picture image here of us being related to this in the sense that we are not only farmers but also the field that, that, that God can work through and, and our lives can be uh, used of God in, in a mighty way. We're working together in a purpose of moving forward with, with the gospel and, and reaching more people. And, and the idea is this, and I think I mentioned this a minute ago, it says the idea here is that we are the field under God's cultivation. You and I are, are to be serving, to be faithful, to be where, where God has called us to be. That might be uh, praying, that might be giving, that might be serving in other areas. Be faithful to what God has given you to do, a working in the harvest, of the first picture that Paul writes. And then the second picture we find here is a, a man working on a house. It says, ye are God's building. The concept here is that the believer is the dwelling place, and the idea is that God is working behind the scenes in our lives, you're in my life, that, that, and that we're the place for God to dwell within us, to be used. So if we're going to be used of God, we have to fill ourselves with the Holy Spirit of God. In other words, we've got to get in the Word of God. We've got to seek His face, seek Him constantly, seek the Lord, and allow Him to use us and us to be the dwelling place. We're going to even see that down in verse number 16 next Sunday night, how our, our lives, our bodies will be the temple of God. Uh, we are working together, in a sense, with Christ to uh, really, it goes back to the wise being wise and unwise in chapter 2, and we looked in detail about that. But, but keeping in mind this, and this is the thing that we need to understand that Paul, I think, was trying to get across to the church of Corinth was that, that one day, one day we will be judged for how we allow God to use us and how we didn't allow God to use us. There's going to be a judgment seat uh, for the believers, for every Christian who stands before God and, and thinks about we have to answer to God for how we handled the things that he gave us, how we responded, how we were obedient to the Lord. And that is a sobering thought if we think about that for just a few moments tonight. And we're going to answer to God Almighty for the things we did and the things we didn't do. And so then we go down to verse number 10. We see here, we see a, uh, really verses 10 through 15, we have two potentials. A two potential that Paul gives us. So first of all, we see the work is entrusted to us. Look at verse number 10. The work is entrusted to us. Verse number 10, it says, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and other, another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. The idea here is that we've been given a certain measure of grace to complete the work uh, entrusted to us. Paul can never get over the fact of, of, of the amazing grace of God, which sought him and saved him and entrusted him with an extraordinary, extraordinary ministry. If you think just for a moment of the life that Paul once lived, Saul, who, who uh, was on the road to Damascus, and God changed his life, and God really transformed him in a mighty way to be used, who was once persecuting Christians, who is now ministering to Christians in different parts of the world. What an amazing testimony of God's grace. Aren't you thankful tonight for God's grace who takes us from where we used to be, who changes us, who allows us to be used? Look, the truth tonight is that we're not worthy, but God sees us as servants to see us. He, he's allowed the grace in our lives to be used. And Paul can never get over the grace of God. And that's what he was getting across here in verse number uh, 10 tonight. Let us never get over the amazing grace of God in our lives. I think of the life... In past uh, times, I didn't serve God faithfully grow up, growing, growing up in a Christian home. Uh, I, I could say the right things, do the right things, but it really wasn't until I was in college that God got a hold of my life. And I think about that, that grace that God spared me from uh, going a different direction, that God led me down the path of ministry to serve Him for the rest of my life. That word master builder, you know, we don't see that often in the Word of God, but it, it carries the idea really related to the Greek word of architect. It's the idea that uh, the only, not only a designer, but also as a principal builder. And so Paul was getting uh, some people that didn't like what he was teaching, people that didn't like what he was doing. And it refers to Paul as being the wise master builder. In other words, he was teaching the people the word of God. Paul was trying to be wise at the church of Corinth. 
And, and God was giving him wisdom on how to lead the church. He, he had to have wisdom in leading them. He had to have the wisdom of God. And so this kind of deals with church, church and ministry, these few verses here. Uh, but Paul was getting across the fact that there was people looking at him and, and not liking the things that he was doing. Paul was responsible really for the well-being of the church. Uh, there were religious leaders trying to build legalism and Judaism on, onto the church. They were adding on to the church. That's why he was saying in the end of the verse, I have laid the foundation and another builder thereon. Is everybody okay? <laughs> We've had a couple of things the last few weeks, uh, you know, random things happen. Um, it says there in verse number 10, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. And so Paul was trying to get across the idea that each person is responsible for the ministry, the place where God has led them. And we need to be careful uh, of things that man tries to add to the church. You know, there's a lot of different churches, a lot of different things, and Paul was basically one of them and one of the church corners to beware of false teachers, false doctrine. And so Paul was just simply trying to get that across in verse number 10. Look at verse number 11. Move on here. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The church is and should be centered around Christ. He is the foundation of the church. Uh, we have some builders here and, and, and workers here who have built houses. I know Junior's built houses and others have built and been involved in building. The foundation is a very important part of the building. Am I right, Junior? The foundation is a, such an important part. And Christ, and Paul related this, as Christ is to be the center of the church. Everything in this church should be centered around him. The foundation of every local church should be Christ. He is the foundation upon which everything is laid. No pastor, no man, no any person will build Christ's church. He will build his church. It's not our responsibility to worry about that. Our responsibility is simply do what God has given us to do. Paul was, was using verse 11 to lead in verse number 12. Look at verse number 12 here. We find this, that he's preparing the way for, for uh, what he's going to use as this next part here in verse number 12. Now, if any man build up on the foundation, referring back to the foundation of Christ, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. So verse number 12, there's a contrast of using uh, higher end or choice materials compared to uh, cheap materials. Now, Junior, you probably answered correctly. There probably are uh, builders who use cheap material. Am I right? They can, they can cut corners. They can cheat ways. They can use cheaper materials. Aaron and I found this out when we uh, were selling our house in Virginia that some of the things that were done in our house before we ever bought the home uh, there were some corners that were cut, some ways that were cut, some things that were cheaper, uh, some things that were not done according to code. They, went, they got by code, but they really weren't done to code. And so Paul was using this uh, analogy here of understanding that the foundation is to be Christ, but there's some other things that can be added onto that. Gold represents here a picture of the person of Christ. Gold in the picture in the Bible, is, in the Word of God, is a picture of deity, is a picture of Christ. High, holy, the, the exalted one. Silver, he uses the word silver here as one of the, the choice materials or the higher, higher end materials in building upon Christ. It's a reference to his passion. It's a reference to the cost of Calvary. Uh, the precious stones that Paul uses in verse number 12 as well refers to his position, now seated at the right hand of the Father. And so it is our responsibility and the church's responsibility to set forth the glories of Christ, the glory of Christ in a sense. Let me read you a quote tonight that I read uh, this week on uh, thinking about these building upon Christ, building this foundation. Now, I want you to know I'm going somewhere tonight. This may seem a little deep in a sense, and I even shared with Dad today that these verses do seem a little deep at times, but I'm going somewhere, and just stay with me for just a moment. The quote says this, We are to speak to men of his person, who, are, who, are, who really he really is, the uncreated, self-existing, second person of the Godhead who stepped out of eternity into time so that he might become man and show his person what God is really like. This is what we lay our foundation on, is, the, is Christ, Jesus Christ, and, and the fact of what he did for us at Calvary and the fact of who he is. And if we would lay everything in this church and build everything upon him, it can't be broken, it can't be torn down. And so by contrast, he uses in verse number 12 here, he uses wood, hay, and stubble. Now, would you build a house with a hay or stubble. Now, you may build a house with wood. It may not last as long, but Paul uses these. These represent things that are added to the church uh, that do not belong to it. You know, man would love to add things to the church, to make the, the church more alluring. You know, if we wanted to 
attract people into church, we could add all kinds of things. We could say, hey, we're giving out 100 bucks to every first-time visitor. That would get a lot of people here probably on Sunday, wouldn't it? And I know a lot of churches do a lot of different things. And again, I'm not, I'm not downing any person, any church, but I am saying that if we're going to we're gonna give something to people, we're going to give them Christ. We're going to give them Jesus because that is something that will last. That is something that will help somebody and not anything else. And we could have special Sundays and we can have special uh, things that we can encourage people to come, but we want to give them Christ. Think about tonight how much has been added or uh, imported into the church by men. A lot of other things. Music has changed. Uh, uh, practices in the church have changed. Things have changed. But we need to simply remember tonight the important thing is that we need to give them Christ. We build our church. We build this church. God builds this church upon himself. This is what will last. Look at verse number uh, 13 tonight. So we see the, the two potentials, a work entrusted to you and I. But we also see tonight the work is tested by him. The work is text, tested by Christ. Look at verse number 13. And this is related to you and I tonight. Every, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. We see here in verse number 13 that Paul reminds us again there will be a day uh, that we will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. This is, this is a thing that we must not look past tonight. Notice, first of all, in verse 13, we see it'll be a day of revelation. It'll be a day of revelation. Salvation is free. God has given uh, his, his son Jesus to die for you and I. Salvation is free. We know that. But rewards have to be earned. Heavenly rewards are based off the things we do on this earth, how we serve Christ faithfully. And we can look at those later on sometime. But um, what we do for Christ now will reap great rewards. What we're doing now, we're sowing, we're sowing, we're sowing, we're working for the Lord, we're serving Him. And, and we should do things because God has given us the opportunity to do them, but we understand this, that one day, one day we'll stand before God. That word declare means to make simple or, or make plain or simple. You think about how many issues that will be made plain enough at the judgment seat of Christ. How many people uh, will stand before for God and, and have unconfessed sin, will have wrong influences, ruined lives, wasted Time and talents, neglect of spiritual things. I, I was I was going on on, a, on the table today about uh, just the the amount of neglect from people on church during this this virus. People look for an excuse. People look for an opportunity to, to get out of church. And, and again, I'm not I'm not speaking to the faithful people tonight. I know I'm just I'm speaking from my heart tonight. People use an opportunity, anything they can, to find a way out of church if if they really aren't serious about their Christian walk. But these things will come to pass. One day, every person, every young person who knows the Lord, every person will stand before God and answer to Him. Not only will it be a day of revelation, but verse 14 tells us it will be a day of reward. Look at verse number 14, a day of reward. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. It is no light matter for us just to have to stand. It's, it's not a light thing for us to understand tonight that we're going to have to stand at the judgment seat of, of Christ one day. What we do now will be rewarded one day. If we work, the work we do on this earth is built with, with proper motive and attitude. The work will, with uh, fire at the judgment seat of Christ, we'll stand before him. It'll be rewarded. If you do the things that God has given you to do, and you use every ounce of energy and opportunity that God has allowed you to do, it will be rewarded one day. Every dollar given, every blade of grass mowed, every bathroom cleaned, everything you do for the Lord will not go unnoticed by God. He, will, he sees it, and you notice those, and God will take note of the things we have done. And this is an encouragement tonight not to waste any time that God, that God has given to us. Look at verse 15. I'm moving on here tonight because I want to get to some applicable things here. Not only will it be a, a day of revelation, a day of reward, but it will also be a day of regrets. Verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. It will be too late at the judgment seat of Christ to say, I'm sorry, or, or I wish I had taken the Christian life more seriously. It's going to be a sad day when people have the same before for Christ and, 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 and commit to him saying, Lord, I wish I had done more. I wish I had, had witnessed some more. I wish I had served you more. I wish I had, uh, had more chances, more opportunities. It will be too late at that moment. There won't be any time for excuses then at the judgment seat of Christ. Now is the time. Tonight is the time to seek the Lord and confess sins and seek Him for cleansing. Now is the time to make what, what restitution we can and begin uh, seriously, uh, get serious about ministry and allow the Holy Spirit to uh, fill our lives and to be used of God. 
By the time we get to the judgment seat of Christ, it will be too late. There's a song that's in our hymn book, and these words, familiar hymn, a lot, oftentimes a hymn that we sing at the invitation. It says this, Must I go and empty-handed? Must I meet my Savior so? Not one soul with which to greet him. Must I empty-handed go? A saved soul, a lost life. You think about those words tonight, those six words, a saved soul, a lost life. You may be here tonight in this room and you've been saved for a number of years. You may have been saved for a short time. Let me ask you a question tonight. When we think about this, we're going we're to give you some applicable truths tonight here in just a moment. What are you doing with what God has given you to do? What are you doing to reach your family for Christ? What are you doing to reach those around you? I don't know about you tonight, but I am burdened for people in my life who need to hear the gospel of Christ. I'm burdened about our young families, our young people in our church who need to get in church and hear the word of God. Let me give you tonight in closing seven, seven habits or uh, things that a concerned soul winner should do. The things that you and I who are saved tonight, who know the Lord, should be doing every week, each and every week. And no doubt tonight, again, I'm speaking to many of you who have gone and invited folks to come. You've, you've handed them a track and you say, hey, I want you to come and be my guest. But, but if we get serious about soul winning, and I, I, I'm, I'm speaking again from my heart tonight, if we get serious, if you and I get serious about this, there should be some habits that should be part of our, our lives, some habits of a concerned soul winning or soul winner. Number one, a concerned soul winner is going to carry gospel tracts everywhere they go. Put them in your purse. Put them in your pocket. I have some right here in my pocket. We have a simple track, a simple gospel track, an invitation that says, be our guest this Sunday, on the back of it, has our church information and the gospel. It's, I keep these in my car. I keep these in my pocket. I keep these in my, my coat pockets. I keep them everywhere I can, I can because I want to be able to access them and hand them to somebody and invite somebody. They're in all our bags we put on doors. They're, uh, we use these a lot. These are great tools. So a, a concerned soul winner will use gospel tracks. They will use every chance. You go through the drive through Now, I know people are kind of weird and standoffish right now about handing things, but if you ask them, okay, can I give you something to read when you get a chance, hand them a gospel track. The second thing a concerned soul winner would do is, is, and let me explain this, would seek a partner. Find another person to go soul winning with you. Find somebody to go out with you. I take some men in the church, and uh, Brother Steve and I went out yesterday, and we were, we were visiting our bus families and encouraging folks to be here. Find a partner and go with them and win somebody to Christ. Go and encourage. Maybe you have a friend. Uh, Dad and I would love to go with you and, and, and talk to a family member, a friend, and encourage them and, and just be a help to you and to be a partner for you to encourage somebody else. Thirdly, a, a concerned soul winner will pray for fruit. A concerned soul winner will pray for fruit. They will seek every opportunity they can to pray for the work of the gospel to go forward. They will pray for every chance they have uh, to see people come to Christ. John 15, 7 says, If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Do you pray for people to be saved? Do you pray for, for folks to be uh, concerned about other people? In other words, you pray for people to come to know Christ as your Savior Number four tonight, moving on, attend soul winning meetings at church. Now we have Saturday visitation, and we have times where we go out different times of the week. Uh, Dad and I go out, uh, we have gone out before his knee surgery, we've gone out and visited folks during the week, but uh, we have Saturday morning is usually our time that we go out and witness and tell people about Christ. Uh, uh, both Steve and Scott and Gary and I have gone out, and Dad's gone out, and some of you have gone out with us too as well. And we take that time to go out. Sometimes we go visit the bus family. Sometimes we go and hang door bags on, on people's doors. But uh, attend opportunities to go soul winning. Maybe it doesn't fit your schedule. We'll find a time. You can take these tracks. We have tons of them in our, our office back here. We have a ton of these. We have hundreds of these that you can take. You say, we need some more. I'll give you a sack of these to take this week with you and go and use them. Uh, wherever you go. Number five, sit with new converts or sit with guests that come into the church. Sit and find opportunities. If you invite somebody to come be your guest, don't just invite them to come and, and help them and fi help allow them to figure out their way. Go and sit with them and encourage them. Uh, maybe hand your, hand your Bible to them. This is what concerned soul winners will do. Uh, number six, they look for visitors. Uh, greeting a visitor can make a tremendous difference. And I, I'm thankful tonight that we have folks come into church on Sundays and different services that many of you go out of your way to encourage them and greet them. And I'm thankful for that. We had some folks visit not long ago, and, and they even commented back to me and said, your church is friendly, and uh, we, we are so thankful that you've make it, made us feel so comfortable. 
And that's what we want to hear. That's what we want to see done. So look for visitors. Number seven, make calls on Saturday nights. Dad and I both on Saturdays will text people, we'll call people, we'll reach out to people. I sat last night for about 30 minutes and I texted some of our families, our bus families, and encouraged them to say, hey, we want you to see you here Sunday. We want you to be here tomorrow. Sunday school's back in. I just sent them a note of encouragement saying, we missed you, we want to see you. And uh, most of the time I get a response back, sometimes I don't. Uh, but we, we make encouragement, we make these calls and texts. You have a phone, you can use it. And uh, next Sunday, next Wednesday, this Wednesday, I encourage you to invite somebody to come along with you. Invite them. You say, well, Pastor Kenny, I have, I've invited so-and-so to come many a times. Well, keep inviting them. Be faithful to the work that God has entrusted you to do. There might be somebody that God has put in your life that you have reached and try to reach, and you're trying to encourage them. Stay after them. I know of one man. I'll finish with this story tonight. I know of a man in our church in Virginia uh, where I serve as youth pastor. Uh, he, he had been uh, out of church, not saved for, for a number of years. He, uh, I think he was probably in his 50s, 40s, 50s. And um, he, he had been out of church most of his life. And his brother, who was one of our deacons of the church, invited him to come. And, and he came and, and his, he invited his dad as well to come. And both of them got saved. And both of them, uh, a few years ago, the, the father passed away. But the other brother, uh, he is still in church serving the Lord faithfully. Uh, you know what? They prayed for that man. I mean, I was trying to get across the point here. They prayed for that. Uh, this, this deacon prayed for his brother many, 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 many years. Prayed for him, invited him, encouraged him, kept inviting him, kept encouraging, kept witnessing to him over and over and over again. And uh, 20, 30, 40 years down the road, he finally came and is serving God faithfully today. We've got to stay faithful to the people that God has put in our lives. Sometimes it gets discouraging, I know. Sometimes it gets frustrating. You feel like you're, you're bending over backwards, trying to encourage people, trying to help people, but be faithful to what, what, with what God has given you to do. A saved soul, a lost life. You and I who are saved tonight have to encourage and have to be a witness to those who are lost, who don't know Christ as your Savior. And we need to be encouraged tonight. As Paul was trying to encourage the church at Corinth to be faithful and what they had been given to do, and as Paul himself was trying to be faithful what God had given to do, let's you and I remain faithful this week to do what God has called us to do.